Hello, everyone. Welcome to session nine of LTech 676. Let me start by saying how great it was to see all of you in last week's synchronous session. I really enjoyed the conversation and appreciated you taking the time to come together and just talk about all of the different ideas and connections that you're making related to the content of this class. So we'll do that again in a few weeks. So thank you for your enthusiasm. I thought it was a wonderful conversation. Also, I want to thank you for the feedback via the mid-semester teaching evaluation. All five of you filled that out, which I really appreciated. So let's take a look at some of the feedback. As you may recall, the first question was regarding this class, what has helped you learn? Well, I did a little informal analysis of your open-ended responses and here's some of the feedback that you gave. One area that is helping you learn in this class are the assignments. Several people mentioned that you found the assignments engaging. Another popular item were the readings. You shared that you're finding them relevant and interesting and contributing to your understanding of the course concepts. Several people mentioned that seeing classmates work is helping you learn, as well as the overall course pacing and organization. One of you mentioned you appreciated the enthusiasm of your classmates and how that's helping you learn. Another area that's helping you learn is the enthusiasm of me as the instructor, as well as the instructional videos, the small class size in the asynchronous format. So this is really helpful feedback. Thank you very much. The next question on the evaluation asked regarding this class, what has made learning difficult? And here is a tally of some of the things. One person said nothing is making the learning difficult. One person said the instructions for the concept map were making learning difficult, as well as the expectations related to the concept map activities. Another person pointed out their personal schedule is challenging. Another area of feedback was waiting on classmates to complete assignments. That makes learning difficult for you. Another area was just in general not understanding expectations, which may have something to do with the concept expectations, not sure about that. And then someone pointed out that in general, they felt like they didn't have enough relevant background knowledge to make some of the connections. And therefore the assignments and readings and some of the topics are a little difficult and making learning challenging in this class. So that's helpful for me to know. Nothing really bubbled to the top, which is typically a good sign, but there are some areas that for me to be aware of that I think are helpful. And then finally, what recommendations do you have for changes to the class? The three of you said none. You don't have any recommendations. One recommendation was to remodel the concept map instructions and expectations. I think that's helpful and something for me to think about. Another suggestion was to open all of the themes at the same time. That is something I can do. I can't open all of the modules all at the same time because I'm constantly updating those, but I can give you a sneak peek of all of the themes and we'll do that in the next slide. And then finally, one recommendation was to make assignments due on Sunday and then have the peer reviews due on Tuesday. So rather than a Saturday, Monday, we do the Sunday, Tuesday. We can try that. And in fact, let's experiment with exactly that schedule this week. Again, thank you for that feedback. It's always valuable for me to get this kind of feedback to see what's working and where there might be some pain points in terms of your experience. This is a slide I use at the end of the semester to show all five course themes. I don't want to keep those hidden if that's something you're interested in. So, of course, we're in theme three now, racial and ethnic divides, differences, and needs. From there, we'll be going to theme four, which is giving voice and disempowering structural inequalities. And then theme five is gender and digital equity. So these are all five themes that we'll cover this semester. Now, finally, if you're interested, there are two important things that I want to share with you. Several of you have asked about the final paper for the course, and you've wanted some more information about that assignment. 
no problem. So what I've done is made that assignment available so you can read about it and have a heads up. I don't assign that assignment until week 14 of the semester. But just to give you some advance notice, I'll share that with you this week. And then finally, if you're interested in reading the results of the mid-semester teaching evaluation yourself, I have PDF'd all of the results so that you can read those. And those are available in Canvas at this link. Thanks, everyone. Again, I appreciate the feedback. Let's get into the main topics for this week. Moving on, we're going to continue with theme three, racial and ethnic divides, differences, and needs. And if you will recall, we left off talking about some of the racial and ethnic divides, both in the output of our education system as measured by the PISA, that International Student Assessment, as well as who is getting jobs where. And we had talked about this particular chart showing the breakdown of racial and ethnic divides in Silicon Valley. And so some of you may be wondering, well, why is that a concern? And I wanted to talk a little bit about the real world implications of the racial and ethnic imbalances that we're seeing in Silicon Valley and the people who might be behind designing technology in general and educational technology in particular. Let's look at an example. Now, here is some really interesting work, and some of you may have seen this before, but this is by Dr. Joy Bulamwini from MIT. And in her work, she's actually tested three commercially available facial analysis programs from IBM, Microsoft, and Face++. And she found that those programs demonstrate skin type and gender biases. More specifically, she found that in general, the program's error rates in determining the gender of light-skinned men were never worse than 80%. However, for darker-skinned women, the error rates ballooned to more than 20% in one case and more than 30% in the other two. And she's argued that those findings raise questions about how today's sophisticated neural networks are trained and evaluated. Obviously, there are some inherent biases to this technology. Dr. Bulamwini has been so concerned by the results that she found, she's actually started the Algorithmic Justice League. And the goal of this particular organization is to highlight algorithmic bias and to provide a space for people to voice concerns and experiences with coded biases. And she also wants to develop practices for accountability during the design, development, and deployment of different technological systems. So if you're interested in the Algorithmic Justice League, I would encourage you to go check that out. Now, this brings us to the book by Kathy O'Neill called Weapons of Math Destruction. And I'm sure this is a very popular book. It came out in 2016. It's relevant here in that O'Neill defines weapons of math destruction as opaque mathematical models that embed human prejudice, misunderstanding, and bias into the software systems that automate numerous aspects of our lives. Now, one review of her book argued that O'Neill believes these weapons of math destruction systematically tend to impact individuals from disadvantaged groups, including racial minorities and those in lower income neighborhoods. O'Neill goes on to argue that weapons of math destruction, these mathematical models threaten democracy in the U.S. insofar as their opacity, scale, and damage reinforce existing inequalities through negative feedback loops. And of course, this should be echoing in your mind with Linda Darling Hammond's case that because of technology, the situation of compounding inequalities in the United States is actually getting worse. And O'Neill is arguing that big data and the mathematical models based on big data is actually contributing to this situation. And she argues that these mathematical models create a false sense of inevitability through the semblance that they are fair and unbiased. And of course, as we've learned from our nature of technology concepts, that technologies 
have inherent biases, and they have intended and unintended consequences. Now, in her book, O'Neill provides some concrete examples of different mathematical models based on big data and how they are creating different problems. So let's take a look at some of those. One of those problems is one that I'm sure everyone in graduate school is familiar with. And this comes from chapter three of her book. In the focus, the model is the U.S. News and World Report system for ranking universities, programs, and majors. And she argues that that ranking system uses specific metrics that universities are actively able to exploit. And this has resulted in some universities taking actions to increase their ranking in ways that are disingenuous. So this is an example of how a technology, a ranking system, can have intended and unintended consequences. And O'Neill is arguing that the results of this system can be exploited and sometimes the results are disingenuous. Finally, one more quick example is from the insurance industry, where O'Neill argues that models used by insurance companies for setting premiums are opaque. As a paying customer for insurance, you can't see why you're paying a particular premium. And these insurance companies use proxies such as credit scores that in turn reinforce existing inequalities. So again, we're seeing this kind of negative, not so virtuous cycle. So what about in education? Are we seeing big data and artificial intelligence having an impact in education? Well, one way to answer that question is to look at the legacy of a company called InBloom. Now, InBloom was funded in 2011. Some of you may be familiar with this case study. It actually launched in 2013 and then quickly closed a year later in 2014. InBloom was a $100 million ed tech initiative with the aim of improving American schools by providing a centralized platform for data sharing, learning apps, and curricula. It was funded in part by the Gates Foundation. But at its launch, there was public backlash over the intended use of student data. Different stakeholders raised concerns about potentially harming children's future prospects or having that data sold to third parties for targeted advertising. The initiative came into conflict with the public's focus on the vulnerability of data systems and the untrustworthiness of corporations and governments. In the end, in blue Bloom catalyzed a national discussion about student data privacy, but the resulting practices do not consistently reflect the values of transparency and grassroots engagement. Instead, ed tech vendors have been driven toward closed systems that tend to be independent and piecemeal rather than part of a large open consortium. If you're interested in education data and particularly student data, I, I would encourage you to read The Legacy of In Bloom. Now, I want to connect the case study of In Bloom to theme three. So my question for you is which subgroups of the U.S. population or really the international population do you think would stand to benefit or be hindered by what In Bloom was trying to do and what biases might be baked into the software platforms that leverage and analyze large swaths of student data? Now, I want to close out by connecting back to this idea of a framework for ethical analysis. And last week, we talked about what are we to do as educators? How should we go about making ethical decisions about technologies such as in bloom? or facial recognition, especially in situations where there might be different and conflicting interests. Well, one idea that has been put forward is something called an ethical matrix. Now, this doesn't come from education. This actually comes from, of all places, agricultural science. This particular ethical matrix was put together by MEPHAM in 2000, and its goal is to facilitate ethical judgments on modern biotech technologies used in food production. As you can see, there are three guiding principles, well-being, autonomy, and justice, and there are different stakeholder groups, citizens, industry, animals, and environment. 
In short, Mepham argued that the ethical matrix is a tool that is intended to clarify and assist discussion about ethical problems and dilemmas. Now, people who have used the ethical matrix in public participation exercises have concluded that it can help identify issues and focus debate. It is a very good vehicle for education and discussion. It can tease out issues and people's feelings and it can enable a wide range of issues to be discussed, and it can aid the decision-making process. And so a question for all of us to consider is what principles and stakeholders need to be considered in an ethical matrix for educational technology? And how might we apply an ethical matrix for educational technology to a technology such as the one proposed by In Bloom? Okay, everyone, we're out of time for today. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.